ready for your next panel. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Please give a huge warm welcome to the wonderful Mr. William Shiner. Yeah. So I, I can barely see you, but the lights were right, so you can see me. I guess that's more important. <laughs> well, I have terrible news. Terrible. Just terrible news. Okay. I had a touch of COVID a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Totally better. Took the pills. I'm fine now. So like a COVID brain? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, just like say yes for people who know what I'm talking about. Yes. yes. So I'm older than most of you. <laughs> it's a laugh for you, but not for me. <laughs> and so I got up this morning. I got up early. I, I'm in Los Angeles, and in San Fernando Valley. And there's the airport in San Fernando, San Fernando. Uh, airport and I, uh, it was five o'clock, and, and and something was pushing me to get up at five o'clock and not, you know, the last possible moment, drive to the airport quickly. I mean, it's Thanksgiving weekend, so maybe I should get up a half an hour early. So again, instead of getting up at five, five thirty, get up at five. I mean, come on, you know. Oh, I know, but a half an hour to go, it's a good yard. So I set the alarm for five o'clock, and I get up. And I forget to take all the pills that oh. and, and I get in the car and I start driving. Now I know how to get to the San Francisco, I mean San, San Fernando Valley airport. I mean I've been living there for longer than most of you are alive. <laughs> I know how to get to the San Fernando airport. I got lost. <laughs> I got lost, and and I get back. This it. What the, what the? It's like five o'clock in the morning. It's dark, so the the impressions are are uh, muddy. They're deep. I've driven it so many times. When I asked my wife Elizabeth to marry me several years ago, I hate talking about years now. I begin to wince. Every time I say a year, like 1986. <laughs> so I asked my wife to marry me, and then uh, you know she. And uh, prior to that, of course, I met her parents in uh, the Midwest, in uh, in Indianapolis. You see, the memory is working, right? <laughs> so when I met her father, he was at the beginning of. Uh, uh, getting Alzheimer's. And I said to him, how's it feel? He said, well, you know, it's this and it's that. And I said, you know what would be a great idea? I'm going to buy you a voice-activated uh, microphone. And you and I will write a book about what it's like to go down the rabbit hole in Alzheimer's. Because he was a he was a, uh, not an artist, but he was a, a creator. He, his job had been creative. So I said, well, well, to this creation, well, I'm thinking this is good for Alzheimer's. I mean, you, you, you start to plan and see and what, and you take your record of it. So he said, that's a great idea. So Elizabeth and I went out and bought a voice activated uh, uh, recorder and gave it to him. And then when we went home, we awaited the tapes from the recorder. And we waited and waited and waited. And then finally one came. This is it. We're going to write a book. And start to play the tape. And his voice comes on and says, well, I'm about to begin a journey. I like uh, coffee with uh, um, so, the journey, you know, kind of boring. 
That's why I love you this way. <laughs> That's it. That was the journey into Alzheimer's. So as I get older, I'm thinking, is my mind going to work? Am I going to be all right? I mean, uh, an actor makes their living doing what I'm doing now, either spontaneously. I like, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth any more than you do. <laughs> Or you memorize and do somebody else's words and, and say them with the same compassion that you would use for your own. That's what an actor does. Am I going to forget? What would I be there as I drive through the streets of Los Angeles? Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley, looking for a huge airport that <laughs> occupies one third of the whole San Fernando Valley, and I can't find it. <laughs> So apparently, I had, but not now, like it's gone. Brain fog. Mm. Brain fog. Who's ever heard of it? You know, you see the fog rolling in on the, on the bridge here. Yeah. You know, and it envelops the whole bridge. I mean, it's like, it's not like scattered mist. Like, uh, oh, yeah, it's cold at that. You can't. I said, uh, who am I talking to? I've got the people who live here. <laughs> You can't see out of the, I mean, you're like six feet in front of you. you it's, it, 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 your vision, is, everything is gone. Is that what I'm facing? I can't find the airport. Ultimately, I, and I left a half an hour early because I had some instinct about the holiday and the weekend. So when I came upon the route, there was a mile and a half length of cars, which means I would not have made my airport. This is holiday weekend. So I, in my not usual, but not unusual way, mm -hmm. I got into the left lane, and I drove that mile and a half right to the very end where the entrance to the airport is, and there's all these, there's all these cars waiting to get in. And I got a book out there uh, called Golden Go, which I think the universe is taking care of me in some way. Hmm. So the instant I got to the entrance to the airport, the green light starts to change, a truck drives into the second lane, and I follow the truck, and I'm in. <laughs> now, that takes, you know, anybody with, with senility could not have done that. <laughs> So I felt a, a moment of confidence, but then I thought I'd tell you a, a, about it. I thought, I thought, well, you know, as you get older, you, and, and you live on the edge like this, I mean, you know, if it's no good, people say, well, what's that all about? What's his name again? Shut up. I guess he's lost it. I haven't lost it. <laughs> more a, a self-propelling statement rather than uh, no, no, I haven't lost it. No, I haven't lost it. I'm good. Yeah. Um, so, very good. Oh, thanks. Very, very, VG, very good is not good either. It's either excellent oh. or you're a thing. That's the way I've been brought up. You're either like, oh, man, I've never seen anything like that. Or, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> so, very good. I appreciate the attempt. At <laughs> so, what we need to do now <clears throat> is that like a change in the. <laughs> like, it's too difficult? You need two people? <laughs> wow. I, 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 I'd love to interview these guys. Yeah. <laughs> that would be something. But. You've got questions, I think. Now, so I can't see anything out here because of the gleam in my eye. Hey, boys, there. Somebody in the yellow shirt. Right? Captain Kirk shirt. No, no. Okay. <laughs> Get carried away. Uh, <laughs> are there many terrific trios here? What? 
Two for, two for trios. Oh, it's been all of us. Stop. Okay. <laughs> I heard the man say there's three terrific trios here. No, does, does that make any sense? <laughs> no. Is it me? Is it my, am I getting senile? That, that doesn't make any sense? We've got three terrific trios? Well, there have been many terrific trios, like the LCD line of the 75 Flyers. Oh, so I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and the question is whether you're making sense or whether I'm receiving or not receiving at the back looking for the airport. Oh, thank God I understood that. <laughs> Turks, Bach, and McCoy. It's one of the greatest trios ever. Spock and McCoy. Yeah. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Okay. And that's, you, you're one third of that trio. Would you like to tell us about the chemistry and what, you, what made you guys so special? Your trio. Incredible. Well, I, I Can you tell was, us about I the chemistry? We, I thought I was. Okay, <laughs> Spock I was and McCoy. <laughs> What? What was it like working? Uh, those two was, gentlemen. Uh, I was working. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you were seven when you made no, 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 it. No, 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 I'll be serious, but because you're all carrying <laughs> okay, I love those guys. I love those guys. I wrote a book on Leonard. Yeah. I admire DeForest as an essential southern gentleman. I love them. Leonard was my best friend. He was a brother I never had. What else do you want to know? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It's a Forrest Kelly. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this, an interrogation? <laughs> get the lights on? I never get there. Get the uh, I don't know, sir. Uh, what about the Forrest Kelly? What about the Forrest Kelly? I don't know. <laughs> The forest, stop! <laughs> you got him up no. in that movie. No. Stop. I'm going to answer your question in the same logical way. As against the way you asked the question. <laughs> the forest Kelly was a beautiful man married to a beautiful woman, Carolyn, in the same way. The, uh, he and she were the idyllic couple in their civility, their knowledge, their kindness, their beauty. I love them. What else do you want to know? Thank you so much for answering my question. They can't be more challenging than that. <laughs> I think that will be your hardest one today. I think so. I certainly hope so, because you get difficult luck moving off the stage. <laughs> I got your signature, I got your photo op, Thank I you. saw you at the convention in 1976. No, yeah. Oh, and all those years. All those years. years. So I wanted to start wait, 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 wait. Yes. All those years. <laughs> 76 for crying out loud? Yes. That's 30 plus 20, that's 50 some odd years ago. But I started watching Star Trek when I was nine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder if I'd be able to find my way home from the same time. You actually signed my program from 1976 over there at the signature site. What? Tell me. Yes. Okay. Tell me, into the mic. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Mm. So you're a little senile, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Lean into the microphone and tell me why you have been this way since 1977. <laughs> because of you. Well, it's going to seem a little idealistic. No! But I love the message of Wait, but he just made a, 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 an opinion. You just made a, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, justification of my opinion? No, well, justification, a rationale. Yes. Mm. You've just made a rationale of your passion. Yes. Why should you have to do that? I don't. Okay. I love... I love Star Trek's message of a united people. Yes. Of 
uh, race, creed, religion, being inclusive. Yeah. And I have lived my life that way because of Star Trek. Wow! There's always the Bible. <laughs> Cindy Lacey. Cindy, is that beautiful? What's your question, Cindy? Um, really, um, one of my favorite Star Trek characters um, was Nurse Campbell, Nigel Barrett. Why? Um, <laughs> because she was kind of off to the side, but she seemed very passionate. And then when well, she well, got wait a into the next look, generation... Let's look, look at that. Cindy, yes. hold on. She was off to the side, but she seemed rather passionate. Yes. I wonder, the word seemed is filled with seams, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Do you want to, want to discourse on that at all? I just kind of want to know what, whether she was, uh, I mean, in Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, she was very, I mean, out there. Well, what is out there? Because I, I never watched it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know nothing about Star Trek, honestly. But what do you know about Marshall Barrett? Was she a kind, funny person? Did you meet her? Did you know her? Oh, yeah. There is a shaded history of management and Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And so, in the right circumstances, I would talk about it, but these aren't the right circumstances because everybody is admiring and, and yes. filled with love, and I don't want to disparage that. I respect that, thank you. Okay. Are we done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you ask that all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do want to say... <laughs> hastily, you do want to say hastily. <laughs> At the 1976 convention, I was six months pregnant, and I did get to ask him a question. Uh, how did you get pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> I asked you if you would ever consider posing for Playgirl. Oh, oh, and that was in 1976, I could still ask you now, but your answer was... Looking up at this guy. Yes, I would, but the staples might hurt. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for what you've given me over the years. Oh, I think you're an incredible you. actor. Oh, my goodness. And but, uh, thank you for those compliments. But my tendency is to resist that and say it's you assimilating a lot of people's work. And I thank you for your Thank your you, William Shatner. A straightforward question. What is the role of the sage or elder statesman in the arts? What is the role of the elder statesman <laughs> in the arts? <laughs> Looking for work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, everybody thinks, oh, he's gotten older, a little wiser, must know more about things than I do. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> If you're a stupid young man, you're a stupid old man. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous. <coughs> Excuse me. I wish I knew more. I, I mean, I feel so ignorant about things. Uh, I know nothing. I know nothing. The only thing I know is nobody else knows anything I know. <laughs> Didn't show to, it me, to me to open it up with a microphone in there. Uh-oh. Hmm. Put the mic down. <laughs> Can someone help? Hang on a second. There you go. You should help him.
Come on a Monday. So, Monday morning, I'm there. And except for a few people, I'm the only one there. The rest of the astronauts are not there. So, where is everybody? Yeah, well, they're coming tomorrow. Oh, you get to go first. Why am I? Somebody says, uh, let's have some breakfast. Okay. So, breakfast. That's the breakfast. No, why don't we drive out to the uh, gantry? I'm driving out to the gantry? Uh, we drive out to the gantry, and we see the gantry. The spaceship is in a hangar somewhere. And it's the desert, the, the landing is at 4,000 feet. So it's like Denver, in effect, which is at 5,000 feet. It's high, it's a mile high, almost. What is that sound? <laughs> it's playing. Children laughing. Children. Children laughing. Children. Oh, children. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the small folks. <laughs> so, uh, I were looking at the gantry, and the guy says, let's, let's go up to the top of the gantry. It's 11 flights up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll get to the third flight. I'm sucking in air, you know. <laughs> and everybody else is sucking in air. And then six, and then nine. And finally, I'm at the 11th flight. <sighs> Woo! I'm leaning on the balcony, and, and I'm looking at a room that has 12 inch walls of cement. Mm. And I said, about the size of this. And I said, what's that? He said, well, yeah, it's a safety room. <laughs> safety room of a what? What, what, what? what do you need a safety room for? Well, in case something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, it's got some air thing, don't worry about it. And down we go, I can get into the uh, uh, electric truck, uh, what's this, uh, the name of the truck company that he likes? Raytheon? Raytheon. 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 And off we go. And I'm thinking, what in heaven's name am I doing here a day early, going up and down a bloody gantry, uh. and then I'm driving back to the, to the, this not palatial place? <laughs> And then it occurs to me, they thought, let's bring the old man in to see if he can get up 11 flights. Uh, 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 well, I passed the test. I was, I was wretched at the end. Uh, give me a coughing slip, uh, and open it up, and I'm going to cough. Next day, everybody turns up, and we start to rehearse. And the rehearsal, is instead of a lot of dialogue is one essentially one moment and that is the moment of weight of weightlessness when you're weightless and you have to get back in your chair now your chair is extended so you're about like this on the in, in the cabin and you're like this because of the number of uh, uh, gravitational forces g forces on you so in order to absorb it, you're like lying flat. But when you're in weightlessness, you're tied in first. Then they say it's weightless, and then you undo your five-point harness, and you float out, and then you've got like three or four minutes. Getting into the chair, weightless. I never did get it straight. Just lying back like this and trying to get your crotch thing in there. It's impossible. There's a lot of jokes can be made, but I've made most of them. <laughs> so, the day arrives, and we all go to the gaffey early in the morning, and there's press, and, and they, they want us to go to the bathroom, because <laughs> you have a plate of breakfast there, and then you have, you know, liquids you wish to consume. And then you're in the thing, and you're up and down, and it takes an hour, and then you land, and there's press, and there's more press, and then there's more press, and there's no place to go to the bathroom. So a lot of, I'm not going to tell you how many, but 
many of the astronauts wore what astronauts wear, which is absorbent uh, underwear. <coughs> because if a, a, an astronaut, in all his or her glory, uh, <laughs> I'm an astronaut, I just put it in my pants. <laughs> It loses all the, the glamour. <laughs> so I didn't wear them, but everybody, apparently everybody else did. And, <laughs> so now I'm sitting in the, the walk up the gallery, and, and the, the and the and the thing is there, the, the the tube is there, and it's I'm guessing from a, an exhaust. <laughs> What's that? If there's uh, too much hiding, but it's bleeding off a little hiding. Hiding? See, I'm from the generation who saw a lot, many times, the Hindenburg burning. And the guy in, uh, who had uh, met the, the Zeppelin, you know what I'm talking about, Zeppelin? Yes. Later on? The guy who was there saying, and now the, the Hindenburg is going to be tied up. So they tie off the Hindenburg like they would a ship. It's a Lego in the air ship. And they tie it off, and unbeknownst to them, and for many years, unbeknownst to everybody else, static electricity went from the ground up the tie-off rope to the anodized hull of the spaceship. It was like slightly metallic aluminum spray on the bags of hydrogen. And a static electricity spark apparently went up the tire along the metallic frame to a gas bag way in the back, very small, that had a small leak. And that spark began the conflagration of the Hindenburg. And if you remember the, the oh, the, 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 the humanity of it all, and people were running away, burning, was, and that's hydrogen. <laughs> and I'm passing by hydrogen getting off gas. And I get into my seat, I'm thinking, I've forgotten about hydrogen. <laughs> And then they said, all right, we're going to begin the countdown. Uh, the team out is 20 in 1910. All right. This is an anomaly. What's the right problem? <laughs> Something that doesn't belong there. Me. <laughs> and all right, now, now, that's all we got it now. now to continue the countdown. Uh, team out is 17, 16. All right, everybody. What about about the tennis, the God's truth? We're going to remove the gantry. Anybody who wants to get off should get off now. <laughs> and I start to go, oh, okay. <laughs> No, I can't do that. I can't do <laughs> four or five G's on you, it feels like an elephant is sitting on your chest, you think, my God, I'm going to die. And then, it's better. We're in weightlessness. And we unbuckle and, and step out of, or come out of our chairs. Now, I had seen footage of uh, uh, Bezos, who had made the first flight, in weightlessness. Cameras all around, of course, uh, in the ship. So I see some footage on Jeff and the young guy. Jeff is floating in space. Uh, as he's, you know, three or four feet up in the air. And as he's gone, he's on his stomach in the air and his feet are pointing upwards. And the adolescent that's with him is throwing skittles at his asshole. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I'm not going to spend my time in space with like that. <laughs> so when they say we have weightlessness, I made my way to the 
uh, window as quickly as possible. And for some reason, I was looking at the back of the window and I saw the submarine. I saw the spaceship acting like a submarine in the air. So there was a wink that the spaceship was forming in the blue air. Never heard anybody else discuss that. That's thing that I looked up. And I saw blackness. And I, like all of you who are obviously uh, exalted by, by uh, science fiction and, and space and the, the incredible awesomeness of, of, of the universe and the energies and the, and the metaphysics and the physics and, the, and the, the, what's the unknown of what's going on in space and the majesty and the awesome <coughs> of space. I was infected as any of you. But that day, <coughs> there was no room. Exaltation. Pause I'll be right back. No applause for drinking water. I do a tap dance. <laughs> I do a tap dance. You'll be happy to block. <laughs> I like to have that. <laughs> Just have pity. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Bill. Okay. See him drinking water. <laughs> so, <clears throat> space had no majesty there. Space was death. It was black. <coughs> it was black as death. And I turned back, and there was this beige, white, blue. And I could see the beginning of the circumference of the earth. Now, <coughs> when I was a kid, just uh, out of high school, I thumbed my way all over the United States, born in Montreal, so for Montreal, <coughs> you're going to feel pity soon. <coughs> from Montreal to New York City, to Washington, to San Francisco, to San Diego, to Vancouver, to Chicago, and on to Montreal. I did it. I've crossed the United States in motorcycles, more than once, in fast cars, slow cars, in a truck, alone, with a dog, with a family. I've done it so many times. One of the most inspiring things is the way a road goes into infinity. And you go along and think, my God, that's forever. And you get to it like that point, and as the, the world continues, I'll do infinity. America seems endless. It's not. That little rock, I could draw like this, that little rock is a little rock. It's literally a conglomeration of debris and rocks with this thin soil that's been eroded by other rocks. And this I'm a pilot. So you need oxygen at 12,500 feet, two miles. Two miles in the air, the oxygen, the oxygen is such that you can't live. You need supplemental oxygen after two miles. You've got two miles of air, this little thin soil, which is barely enough to put your fingers through in places, and this rock, and we're living on it. I read. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which she published many, many years ago. And I didn't quite understand it. I understood DDT and the soft eggs and the, and the birds that were, they were, they were facing extinction because the eggs were breaking because of DDT. This is the most powerful, wonderful 
killer of insects, so crops can grow, not remembering or not even knowing, I guess, in those years, that insects was the fountain blood, or the blood was, the, was the, the means by which so many entities, plants, trees, animals, birds, it live on the flow, the continuity of insects. And we've invented something that's so wonderful, it's killing all the insects so we can grow more crops. Is that crazy? And I thought, this is incredibly stupid. But surely somebody else goes more than... It went on for years and years. It's going on. The stupidity behind DDT and all the subsequent mistakes are apparent to all of us. And it continues. And when we landed, I found myself sobbing. I thought, what am I crying about for crying out loud? Why, 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 why am I crying? And in front of the camera, right? And I'm, you know, and I try to apologize, and I went off into a corner. <clears throat> Wasn't that an interesting sound? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what's the matter? And then I realized a rather familiar feeling. I was in grief. I was, I was in grief for the world. I could see the, I read about all the extinctions. I drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco back in a day to do something or other. And in that, what is it, 700 miles from, when I, when I used to drive, I drove, drove it all the time. Uh, especially when I was younger, you'd have to stop every 100 miles or so and scrape the insect yeah. off the, the debris of insects on the Sunday King Valley. My trip there and back in the day, there was one splat, one insect I killed. That's where the insect world is today. I was in grief and I found myself sobbing. Finally, all of this passion, because I've been reading in the many years the interconnection of life. It's unbelievable when you look at it. The interconnection started in the primitive seas where cells not absorbed each other. They didn't fight, maybe they did, but some of them were acquired and, and, and became us. We are those early cells. We are the algae that became grass, that became trees, that became us. It's not like, oh yeah, we're all like, no. We're the same. Everything is the same. We're all parts of the intelligence of life. And we're killing it. I can't believe it. So I was overwhelmed. And one of the things I wanted to do, I knew I had to do, was to remind you of how sacred life is. <coughs> and we participate in that sacred life. It's up to us now to stop giving it. Thank you so much.